Seattle Atheist Church. Atheists, agnostics, skeptics, free thinkers, whatever you like to call yourself, you are welcome here. At Seattle Atheist Church, we call ourselves an atheist church because you will never hear anything supernatural promoted from the podium. Our church was founded on the principles of scientific naturalism and secular ethics. Truth claims are attempted here, and we stand ready to revise our thinking in light of new information. We attempt to be excellent to all conscious beings, and we believe in good, because good works in non-mysterious ways. If that sounds right to you, you are probably in the right place. Before we get started, uh, I want to just go over a few announcements. Um, at 7 p.m. at Third Place Books in Ravenna, um, a lot of us are going to go see Phil Zuckerman, who will be reading from his book, What It Means to Be Moral. Why Religion is Not Necessary for Leading an Ethical Life. So that's at Third Place Books in Ravenna at 7 p.m. He is a professor of sociology and secular studies at Pitzer College in Claremont, California. And he's the author of several books, including Living a Secular Life. So next week, we're going to have our planning meeting. Everyone is welcome. It's the same time, same place. We always meet every Sunday at noon in this room. And we'll be planning all the upcoming talks next week. Please join us for that. Um, every third Saturday of the month at Browers, we have our secular social, and that's at Browers in Fremont. So uh, anyone over the age of 21, today and every second Sunday of the month, we have board games. That's going to be at the Wayward Coffee House at 65th and Ravenna. Uh, please, what? Roosevelt. At Roosevelt. I'm so sorry. Yes. Okay. Um, I'd also like to make you aware of some events by uh, a different group than ours. So we're Seattle Atheist Church. This is Seattle Atheists. And every Sunday morning, they take a walk around Green Lake. They meet at 10 a.m. at the nearby Pete's Coffee. And they finish up around 11 a.m. There's plenty of time to go there and then come here if you'd like to join us uh, afterwards. And also every third Thursday of the month, they meet at Rosie's Pizzeria in Greenwood for dinner. So you can find them also on Meetup. They're also on the second Sunday of the month. We have a book club. Oh, second, Rosie's second Sunday. At six o'clock. Okay. And so second Sunday of the month, they have a book club also at Rosie's. Yeah. So please remember to RSVP when you're going to come to Seattle Atheist Church. Um, because basically, as you can see, we usually have a full house, uh, but if only a few people sign up, uh, newcomers don't know what to expect. So it's helpful if everybody would, you know, if you remember, go ahead and click that you're going to come. Um, when you shop on Amazon, remember to check out the Smile program. Amazon donates a percentage of the things you buy on Amazon to a charity of your choice. And Seattle Atheist Church is one of those choices, and we would really appreciate that. So, if you find coming to this um, event, Seattle Atheist Church, valuable, um, please consider donating to support us. You can do it off seattleatheist.church, or you can donate here in the room. There's usually a meetup jar or a donation jar, or Troy, who's right here, uh, also can take a donation. Okay. So what we do is every Sunday, the members ourselves give the talk, and today we are going to have a talk by Emma, um, uh, by Emma on the psychology of haters. Welcome up. Greetings. I'm Emma Chase, and today I'll be talking about the psychology of haters. Um, my talk will be about the most immediate and important manifestation of hate in the U.S., the avid followers of right-wing media, the haters, and the hate that they have for so many others. I will attempt to characterize this hate and the people who have it. I will 
give a brief description of how it, this has developed. Uh, I'll look at some of the causes of this hate and what fuels it, and finally I'll outline some of the things that we might do about it. Um, many existing right-wing groups, including right supremacists, have been radicalized by the right-wing ecosystem, including Fox Radio, Fox News, many internet bloggers. This, this inter in ecosystem also includes Republican donors and politicians, as well as right-wing power centers like Rover Norquist. The power of these groups is enhanced by their zeal, their, their hate. They push more moderate elements to the right for fear of them. The extent of their hate and accompanying violence varies, but they seem to have some common characteristics. <coughs> Much of this talk will be based on the brainwashing of my dad by Jen Senko. It's a documentary that uses her father as a case study of the hate-filled, radicalizing influence of the right. I highly recommend you watch it. Uh, it's available for speak, to stream on several sites. So when, when Jen was young, her father had been a rather non-political Kennedy Democrat before moving and getting a new job that meant a long solo commute instead of carpool. He started to listen to AM talk radio during his commute and over time became an anger-filled extremist. He graduated to Fox News and started subscribing to right-wing blogs and columns. He became insufferably angry all the time, especially when somebody would uh, say something against his views. Um, forwarding hate-filled emails, isolating himself, including from his wife. He became totally subsumed in his political mania. No one could reason with him or talk rationally to him without an angry outburst. He believed, without question, everything Rush Limbaugh and Fox News told him. In short, he had become brainwashed, a hater. This is an extreme case, but not uncommon. Uh, many more people suffer a less extreme version of this. So how do the haters maintain their hate? largely without much self-awareness. Here's a reading from Hater's Cognitive Mechanisms by Gregory Parks. In essence, the hater is too easily, the hater, thank you. <laughs> uh, the hater is too easily embraces or may affirmatively search for negative information about the hated object. They are susceptible to confirmation bias, the tendency to search for interpret, focus on, and remember information in a way that confirms their own pre preconception. Not surprisingly, haters exhibit an attentional bias, the tendency to have their perceptions of hate, hated object be affected by their recurring ne negative thoughts about that object. Similarly, there's a tendency for haters to engage in selective perception, where expectations about the hated object affect the hater's perception of information about said object. Therefore, it is inevitable that haters tend to be susceptible to the focusing effect whereby they tend to place undue weight on certain aspects of event, namely those aspects that cast negative light on the hated object. Haters also strenuously resist positive information about the hated object, no matter how overwhelming that information is. In part, they may be susceptible to conservation bias in that they are unable to revise their beliefs sufficiently when presented with new evidence. Here, positive information about a hated object fails to alter the hater's evaluative needle of the hated object. This may be because of the simple ways of reflex or the tendency to reject new evidence that contradicts the paradigm. In fact, efforts to augment the judgments of the hated object by providing haters with this confirming evidence may simply strengthen their beliefs observed in the backfire effect. These processes have nothing to do with how well-educated or intelligent the hater is or is not. Motivated reasoning is self-deceptive, irrational, and lies outside the conscious awareness. As psychologist Ziva Kunda noted, people do not realize that the process is biased by their goals. 
they are accessing only a subset of their relevant knowledge and they would probably access different beliefs and rules in the presence of different directional goals. And they might even be capable of justifying opposite conclusions on different occasions. In my experience, haters cannot be reasoned with and accordingly, that is why as Taylor Swift notes in her song, Shake It Off, and the haters <laughs> gonna hate, hate, hate. <laughs> So how do the haters get that way? Well, you have core inherited biases and fear. They're, those are augmented by the right-wing ecosystem, especially the radio talk and Fox News, to keep large segments of the population into believing lies, their lies and misrepresentations of the news. The extent of the effect on individuals is dependent on a number of factors, but a large number of people are, have been affected. The sort of hatred is not spontaneous. It is taught and maintained through a proliferation of lies about events and objects of their hatred. That is where the expert liars in the media come in. Rush Limbaugh, Bill O'Reilly, Sean Hannity, for example. They have several techniques to brainwash their audiences that I will enumerate later. Their audiences tend to be information poor and so susceptible to manipulation by others. They tend not to listen to alternate sources. Similar to religious belief, they use a different set of facts that have been fed to them and are not critical thinkers, but will believe authority figures like Rush, Rush Limbaugh, champion of the overdog, and Sean Hannity, who are seemingly constantly outraged about a number of things, making them seem well-informed and truthful when they are actually making things up and ignoring conflicting them information. This outrage is the, the emotional factor in the brainwashing. They are very talented liars that project a consistent but almost totally false narrative of current events. Rush sounds so confident and outraged it makes even those that know the real facts doubt themselves. Jen's father says, I don't care what your facts are, I believe Rush. So how did all this happen? How did, how did this ecosystem develop? Well, um, after the landslide election of 1964 against Barry Goldwater, many said the right was dead, but it set some wealthy people on a course to have their own media and attempt to discredit the mainstream media, which tended to be objective and fact-based. The Republican noise machine was born. Roger Ailes, then a Nixon advisor on media, told Nixon to, the public was dumb and he should use snappy one-liners, which were easy to remember. Nixon was told to make it simple, boil it down, and they will get it. Ailes was a pioneer in the use of the sound bite. A 1970 memo, a plan for putting GOP on TV news, became a blueprint for Fox News. Ailes wanted to avoid the censorship, quote, censorship, priorities, and prejudice of network news. He claimed people watch television news because they were lazy and wanted their thinking done for them. His idea was to be like a tugboat, pushing the Queen Mary, constantly moving national thought to the right a little bit at a time. Um, the tag, fair and balanced, was born. All this led to a landslide for Nixon in 1970. The brilliance of Nixon was to, free, to frame policy of deference to the money, to the moneyed and, and the bureaucracy <laughs> by saying a real, the real snobs are not those who hire and fire, but say those who de that decide cultural trends, the origin of the complaint against po uh, political correctness. To get working people to vote for him, Nixon sided with veterans and those against protesters. Nixon ran against civil rights movement and busing in the South, uh, in the Southern strategy to switch allegiance of Southern Democrats to Republican based on race. Hard hats attacked protesters, so Nixon invited them to the White House. Conservative populism meant we should not vote on economic, but on moral issues, hence the phrase traditional family values. 
the right wing got money together to appoint right wingers as professors and to think tanks. They formed publishing houses to buy media for them. Does Ronald Reagan's slogan, Let's Make America Great Again, referring to 1900, sound familiar? Um, the smaller government mantra began, and Reagan's re revolution used a vocabulary which made conservative economic theory sound good to the white, white middle class. Trickle down economics was invented. That is a theory without any economic basis that giving money to the rich people will create jobs and prosperity for everyone. Says Turkle said the only thing trickling down in the 80s is meanness. Um, 1987 was the repeal of the Fairness Doctrine, which means broadcasters no longer had an obligation to be truthful in shows. It, uh, to show news fairly. Hillary's vice, vast right-wing conspiracy includes this ecosystem. The right-wing media, politicians, conservative organizations, legal foundations, media organizations, think tanks, and advocacy groups. It was true, but many at the time made fun of her for thinking there was this grand conspiracy. Um, 1996, telecommunication, Telecommunications, Telecommunications Reform Act handed the media system to a handful of corporations due to political donations on both sides. Before this time, most TV news was from the three major networks, which were partitioned off from the commercial side of the business. Fox was launched in 1986 also, with Rupert Murdoch back, backing and with Hales in charge of Fox News. False stories on Fox began to spill over into other media, creating the Fox effect, which increased their, their influence. Almost, there was almost no journalism involved in Fox News. It's almost, almost totally opinion-based. In, in fact, um, Bill O'Reilly claims the ACLU is a terrorist organization trying to take away our rights. And uh, Fox also launched the war on Christmas, uh, which was promoted for pro profit, their profit, their, their ratings. Um, so what are the tactics that Fox uses? to brainwash their viewers. Uh, one is to lie and skew. If you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. That's from jo Joseph Goebbels, a Nazi minister of propaganda. Um, and 63% uh, of Republicans still believe that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction when they were invaded. Um, and uh, Fox promotes endless fake study to bolster commentators' arguments that just don't exist. In a questionnaire where people were asked about current events, Fox News viewers actually get worse than those who watch no news shows at all. Another tactic is to create confusion and doubt, the noise machine. Doubt is our our product since it is the best means of competing with the body of fact that exists in the mind of the general public. It's a memo from Brown and Williamson, the former tobacco company. Fox continues to promote climate change denial even though only four of uh, 24,210 peer-reviewed articles in 2013 and 14 said humans do not cause global warming. Next is blame and divide. Uh, the, the entitlement state is a long-running way of setting the middle class against the poor. One example. Another uh, tactic is to use the language of framing. Framing uh, 
was professionalized in 1994 with Frank Levitz with phrases like death tax instead of estate tax. Um, takers instead of poor people don't tax. Rich people becomes encouraged job producers. Energy exploration instead of drilling for oil. And government takeover for healthcare instead of healthcare reform. Once chosen, these phrases are chanted like Rain Man by the whole right wing ad nauseum. Fear mongering and use of emotion. Um, Fox is the phony outrage machine. The idea is to terrify, terrify and terrorize the audience during every waking moment. When people are afraid, they don't think rationally. And when they th don't think, can't think rationally, they'll believe anything. In fact, Donald Trump himself seems to be a hater. He seems to be brainwashed mainly by Fox. He spends hours a day watching Fox. He repeats many of the Fox themes. His cabinet appointees are largely Fox news contributors that have virtually no credential. He repeats their talking points and consults with Sean Hannity on policy. Trump openly empowers and encourages haters to express their radical feelings and violent behavior that doesn't accept any blame. The MAGA bomber and El Paso shooter who, who credited Trump as his motivator for extreme cases that he helped create. Um, so what happened to Jim's dad? Well, his radio brother moving to a retirement community. He started eating lunch with his wife again. Then their TV broke. Jen's mother reprogrammed the remote to make it hard to get to uh, Fox News. Then their, then their TV broke. And Jen, uh, uh, well, then cleaning his computer for disk space, his wife unsubscribed him to the worst email sources and added some progressive ones. Uh, the result was a substantial change in his views and attitude. He was much happier and no longer always angry. He ended up with mixed political opinions that were much less important to him. He even said he liked Obama. This cannot be done generally, but the principle of widening exposure to more facts and opinions and removing the constant outrage uh, can be applied more widely. So um, if you are more skilled at talking to haters than I am, mm -hmm. I try. <laughs> you might try uh, this organization called Hear, Hear Yourself Think. 